All right, we're going to jump right in tonight. I hope everyone's well, everyone is doing well. We are going to be looking at Genesis 45, Genesis 45, verses 1 through the beginning of verse 8. You can find your way there and only hold your place because we'll be getting to the text in a few minutes. We'll be looking at the life of Joseph from the climax of the story that spans 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. You should be familiar with the story. You know how it begins. He was the object of favoritism in his father's household growing up. His brothers resented him for that. And so when he was 17 years old, they saw their chance. His father sent him down from where he was in Shechem to the north, down the slope to Dothan, where they were shepherding their flocks. And they saw him coming down the slope. And the text says they saw him from a distance. They said, let's kill him. That's how the story of Joseph begins. But God had bigger plans for Joseph. That was not his end. He was sent down to Egypt at the age of 17, and 13 years later, he is the prime minister of the most powerful country in the land. He's the second in command next to Pharaoh. You also know how the story ends. The story ends in chapter 50 when he tells his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now, Joseph was 56 years old when he made that statement at the funeral of his father. But he found his footing much, much earlier than that. Joseph was grounded in God's providence. And that's the title for tonight, Grounded in God's Providence. It's what Joseph was. It's what you and I need to be, grounded in God's providence. Our outline is simple. Our outline is simple, and you can go ahead and put it up there. It's the shape of God's providence. It's the shape of God's providence. It comes in dual form. It comes in dual form, a sovereign circumstance and a divine purpose. And you see, what we did there was just define God's providence biblically. And so by dual form, I mean like the coin that, well, probably is now in a glass jar. We don't even use them anymore, but... Coins have two forms, and they go together. You never see a circumstance God is sovereign over without any purpose. Likewise, God never purposes something without superintending, overseeing a circumstance he's sovereign over. And so Joseph was grounded in God's providence. He had clarity on this. His life ref- reflected a commitment to the Lord regardless of circumstance, and at least everything that Moses records of him is in the faithful call. How can we be like that? How can you find yourself aiming at the character that Joseph is known for? How can a man be so faithful? It almost seems unobtainable, a trust in God that transcends every circumstance. even unbearable circumstances, unpredictable circumstances. We need to know something about the man before we look at Genesis 45. We need to know something about him before we see those sovereign circumstances and divine purposes coming together. So turn with me to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. This is the psalmist history of God's providence and the patriarchs in poetic form. Joseph makes an appearance in verses 17 through 22. So Psalm 105, if you found your way there, I want you to look at verses 18 through 19. And bear with me, we're going to look at the grammar and we're going to learn something about the life of Joseph from the psalmist that will better inform the circumstance that he finds himself in In chapter 45, the the climax of his life and a milestone in his family and in redemptive history. Verse 18 says this, 
They afflicted him with fetters. He himself was laid in iron. 19, until the time that his word, that's God's word, came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. Now, in, in order to understand this section properly, we need to make a decision. Before, this, before verse 18, you see him going down to Egypt. And after verse 19, you see him being pulled out of prison. So what is verse 18 depicting? Well, the grammar actually solves that for us. This is a depiction of young Joseph being sold into slavery. Verse 18, where it says, they afflicted his feet with fetters. Feet and fetters are actually in the singular. He himself was laid in iron, in the irons. The idea here is an iron collar. And in fact, the ESV just gets that one right. His neck entered the iron. So this is a picture of Joseph in a chain gang. This is a picture of young Joseph at 17 after he was pulled out of the hole, half naked and sent to a bunch of strangers down to Egypt to be sold as a slave. The main verbal idea comes in verse 19, however, and this is where we, we can glean something about the man in the circumstance. It says, until the time, that is from that time on up until the word of the Lord came to pass, contextually, the word of the Lord that came to pass would have been the moment he stood before Pharaoh and then was not in iron chains, but put in gold chains and been put to the purposes that God had ordained that he was sovereign over. So from iron chains to gold chains, what happened? The word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. Now those two verses cover 23 years of a man's life. And a lot happened in that span of time, falsely accused, forgotten about. So in one sense, his circumstances went from bad to worse for 23 whole years. That's a long time. However, God's word was more formative to Joseph than his circumstance. God's word was more formative to Joseph than his circumstance. Okay, we've got to answer the question, what word? What word are we talking about? Because this was written 430 years and some change later. So what are we talking about? What word of God is it that formed him? You see, you need to know that God has never given his people less than enough to walk by faith. God has never given his people less than enough self-disclosure and future hope to bank on. All the way going back to Genesis 3. And so what is it that the psalmist has in mind here concerning Joseph. Well, by the time Joseph was 17, God had revealed his future plans to Abraham and his descendants. Those plans were repeated. Those plans were passed down. And by Joseph's time, he knew that, well, God had promised Abraham a land for him and his descendants as an everlasting possession he, he knew that Abraham's descendants would outnumber the stars and the sand of the seashore. He knew that by Abraham's line, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And one descendant in particular would possess the gate of his enemies. That, that, that's, that's a picture of dominion. That is, the dominion of this one descendant, enemies, would become his dominion. Joseph, by way of the spoken word of, of God, knew that God would make his fathers into a great nation, but also that God had told Abraham to know for certain that his descendant, descendants would be made slaves in a nation not their own for 400 years. This would have been no secret in Ab uh, Joseph's family he would have been aware of those expectations. And in God's providence, God removed Joseph from everything familiar so that he had to walk by the assurance of things hoped for 
the conviction of things not seen. Not intangible things, not optimistic well-wishing, but concrete expectations. And his faith, that is Joseph's faith in God's future promises, shaped him. They shaped him. That was the filter that he evaluated his circumstances through, God's promises. And so God, Joseph was dialed in to God's promises, and they gave him a footing in every circumstance from the time he was put in the chains onward. So now he is 39 years old. He is wearing those gold chains. He's ruler of Egypt. And there is not really a, a modern equivalent to what Joseph was. Prime ministers, um, as you know, um, I think this just happened across the pond recently, can get ousted. Uh, when critique comes, they can, they got to go. Well, not in Joseph's cir circumstance. Um, he was second in command, but as far as anyone else mattered, besides Pharaoh, he was the boss. He was the one writing the laws. He was the one making decisions. He's the court system. He's the legislative system. He is the executive branch. So he truly was a sovereign in every sense of the word, save Pharaoh. His brothers come to him. Along with everyone else, this famine was severe. Of course, it was in Egypt, but it was also in Canaan and, all, and probably all of Mesopotamia. And, and his brothers, along with the rest of the population that is coming in rotation, comes to buy grain, comes to buy grain. And then there's 10 guys that come through the door and jo Joseph recognizes them. He knows those guys. He makes sure that his interpreter is here because he doesn't want to reveal his identity to them. And so they stand before him totally indebted at this point to him. Their lives in his hands. And he does reveal himself in chapter 45. So let's go to that text. Let's go ahead and read it. And then we will examine it closely. Chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out for me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing or harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph was grounded in God's providence. His hope was fixed on God's future promises. And so when he makes himself known, he returns to the question that he just could not shake. And so this is the first observation I want you to look at. He continues to ask the same question he's been asking for several chapters. Is my father still alive? And there's more to this question than meets the eye. The question gets repeated over and over in the narrative. And did Joseph miss his dad? Of course. Of course he misses his dad. 22 years away from him, wondering, waiting, eating alone, at least until he was given a wife. Of course he missed him. But more importantly, as Moses records the story, Joseph's question has to do with the promises that God gave Abraham, gave Isaac, and gave Jacob. J uh, Joseph had banked his life on God's promises. Everything familiar to him had been taken away from him. And the only constant that he was left with was believing that God would bring every, promises to, every promise to pass, just as he said he would. 
Now, the, his question doesn't reflect an uncertainty of God's promises as if, if Joseph was not alive, then God somehow wouldn't be able to bring his promises to pass apart from him. See, those promises were unconditional. Those promises were predicated on God himself. But Joseph knew that those blessings were passed on by birthright until they come to fruition. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to who? See, Isaac had died unbeknownst to Joseph nine years earlier, about the same time that he stood before Pharaoh. Joseph missed that. And he had no reason to trust his brothers. So the burning question, is my father still alive? When Jacob had sent his brothers down to Egypt in the first place, he did so, so that they would live and not die. So they went back, they went down to to, uh, Egypt. They went to go see Joseph by grain. Joseph recognizes them coming down the corridor or however, however they were situated administratively. And he recognizes them. And instead of selling grain to them immediately, just like he did with the rest of the people that came from Canaan, he set them aside, put them in jail and decided what to do with them. He toyed with them and sent them back to Canaan minus Simeon. Held him hostage, left him in the dungeon and said, you need to bring Benjamin down here. You say you have another brother? Let's see him. Are you, are you honest men? Prove it. Send him down too. And so when his brothers, the, the ten get, uh, or the nine rather, get back to Jacob, this is upsetting. Jacob is upset. See, he's fearful about the prospect of losing another son. So Reuben tries to convince him. Saying, if I don't bring Benjamin back down, you can kill my two sons. And, and I, I, can, I can only imagine the, the stare from Jacob. This is not compelling. This, this adds insult to injury. Thank you, Reuben. So they ate everything they had. They, they, they went through all their food, went through all the grain. By my estimation, this is uh, several weeks time, not much longer than that staring at each other again, the way that the narrative begins. No food. What do we do? So Judah. Judah comes to Jacob. See, Judah knew what it was like to lose two sons. And he was compelling. He was persuasive. But how was he persuasive? He says, you know, we we could have done this twice by now. Why should we die We, you, and our little ones. This is a particular household that cannot die. (laughs) Jacob knew that. And so in an act of faith, Jacob says, okay, go down. Bring the lad. Bring some gifts. And may God have mercy on you in the sight of the man. So they go back down. They return. They still don't recognize Joseph. He hasn't made himself known yet. But Joseph's question before, now he sees Benjamin, but he doesn't address Benjamin. Before he even sees Benjamin, what's his question? How is your father? Is he still alive? Is your father still alive? He continues to toy with them. And meanwhile, while he is toying with his brothers, God's providence is playing out with them as well. Why is Joseph toying with his brothers? Putting their their money back in their sacks, sending them back, chasing them down, bringing them back, putting one in jail. Why is he doing this? It's the wrong question. Why is God purposing Joseph to do that? What were Joseph's purposes? Not important. What was God's purpose in Joseph's toying with his brothers back and forth? 
keeping one, sending the rest back, keeping them all in jail, sending one out. What was he doing that for? When they first get in trouble with Jacob, or I'm sorry, with Joseph, Joseph can, of course, understand them because he speaks their language, same native tongue, their brother, speaking to him uh, through an interpreter. And of course, they say, this is because of what we did to Joseph. Did you not hear the boy screaming for his life, pleading for his life? I told you not to sin against him. So their, their conscience had the right instinct. And as the toying back and forth plays itself out, they begin to ask the right question. They find their money in their sacks. What is God doing to us? What is this that God has done? Finally, as we approach chapter 45, and their lives are in his hands, through the toying back and forth of his brothers, Judah says, God has uncovered our iniquity. God has uncovered our iniquity. You see, in God's economy, covering up sin won't allow you to prosper. But confession leads to mercy. And that's what we see play out right here with the brothers. Before, before they get clarity on God's providence, God is bringing them to a place of confession and even repentance. Joseph tries sending everyone back, but keeping Benjamin. And so Judah says, sir, can I have a word in your ear? And, and he recounts the whole story, the back and forth and what he said to his father and what they came and said to them and their bewilderment. And he says, look, you, you can't keep Benjamin. You can't keep him here because if you do, you see, I've been made a surety for him before my father. And if, and if we come back and he sees me come back without the boy, Jacob will die. Jacob will die. He will die. My father will die. And then Joseph cannot take it anymore. You see, at this point in redemptive history, God's promises had made it as far as Jacob. The promises that God gave Abraham would come to pass through Isaac, not Ishmael. And Jacob, not Esau. So what happens next? Is my father still alive? It wouldn't be until uh, 17 years later that God expands those promises, just as he, as he did when they were given to Jacob. Jacob passes that blessing along on his deathbed and says, the scepter will not pass from Judah until he comes who demands the obedience of the peoples. Okay, now we're watching Judah. Now we're watching Judah's line. As for Joseph, Jacob had added a specific allotment of land to his personal inheritance, which of course means two things. Number one, he'd have to stand there to receive it. And it would have to be the same allotment that he promised to Jacob, the ground that he took from the Amorite with the bow and the sword. Joseph banked his life on God's promises all the way until the end. So much so that at the end, he by faith made mention of the Exodus and gave orders concerning his bones. Joseph, uh, along with his fathers, lived in an expectation of God's future promises. They lived by faith. They, they didn't place their hope in present circumstances or even circumstances that they could bring about themselves. It's, it's not so different from the expectation that you need to live by. Now, the seed promise that they were looking for has arrived in Jesus of Nazareth. That's why the genealogies have ended. That's why the first four and a half chapters of your New Testament are dedicated to proving from the Old Testament that Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Christ who was predicted to come. All the way, 1 to, 1 to 417. And then we heard the book into that this morning. Okay, he's here. Go tell everybody. Fixing your hope on anything 
any time, person, event, circumstance before the return of Christ will disappoint you. See, the New Testament, the exhortation of the New Testament is to set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Completely, all of it. All of your hope, all of your expectation. You know, besides, what, what will you do? What, what will you do even if you achieve all that you, have, that you have in your mind, all that you set your mind to, what will you do if you achieve it all? What will you do if you carry out everything you look forward to? When the best of circumstances play out, then your health fails. Resources exhausted. Relationships expire. And it's time for you to breathe your last. What expectation will you have left? Don't, don't, don't arrive in that moment empty-handed, having exhausted every hope and expectation. A solid footing in God's word will temper your response to changing circumstances, unpredictable circumstances. When you wake up and then the end of your day, you never could have guessed you'd be where you were. Look at how De uh, Joseph deals with his brothers after revealing his identity to them. From a footing of faith, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 45, they were speechless. They were speechless, terrified and taken aback. The, the text says that they were dismayed at his presence. And you probably know this and have heard it, but the way that the Hebrew language expresses that spatial relationship is the proximity is communicated by before the face or before the eyes in the presence of, and, 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 and in, some, in some cases, it, the, uh, at a minority of times when there's a scary circumstance, the, it's a separative idea. Uh, away from the face of when Noah, when Noah entered the ark, he entered away from the face of the waters. It's terrifying, right? Well, that's the case here. That's the case here. They, they, when they realized who this man was and the authority that he had and what they had done to him, which you could chalk up as murder, they took a step back terrified. But, but if you have a, a firm footing, a, a, if you're grounded in God's providence, you can discern the circumstances and you can respond in this way. No, no, come closer to me. Come closer. You see, he, they were terrified because of his office and what they had done to him and what he could potentially carry out at the flick of a wrist. But in, instead of renaming himself as Joseph, the, the ruler of Egypt, he says, I'm your brother, your brother. He, I'm your brother, Joseph. And, and he comforts his brothers. He comforts them. He says, this is no accident. He says, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you. And so he actually puts them together. He says, we were both sent here. I just got sent ahead of time. Okay. He, he, he could have expressed that a number of ways, but he puts him and his brother together, his brothers together under God's provision according to God's purposes, because he was grounded in God's promises, he could discern the circumstances. Now, hindsight is 2020, and that's even giving it, that's a little too much, I think. You know, we, we don't really see 2020, <laughs> hindsight. But, but that is where we can, we can see God's work maybe a little bit more clearly than in the moment. Uh, you know, we're all geniuses when we look back and say, God was in that. God was in it, and he was doing something, because gosh, you know, if, if, if 
that didn't happen then, then we wouldn't be here now and we wouldn't be doing this. So he must have been working, had to be working. God was in that. But what about in the moment? Are you grounded in the moment when difficult situations come about? I was texting back and forth with uh, Zach Han this week. And I was ministered to by our missionary who we sent out from here by his perspective on God's providence. He knew this was going to happen. Not sure what he has in store for us, but I'm convinced of his promises. I'm convinced of his sovereignty. That was an encouragement to me. That's right. Those pictures I saw were pretty scary, pretty deflating. But, but when you are grounded in, in God's providence, knowing that the circumstances that you're in, God is sovereign over, and they are not at random, they have purpose. Well, then, then you have a solid footing to endure the circumstances that you're in. So he comforts his brothers. He says, this is no accident, guys. God is at work here. This is his plan to bring about his purposes. Verse 5 says, we were sent here to preserve life. To preserve life. And then verse 7, to secure a remnant for the land. If your translation says earth, that would be a great place to uh, just put land there. And to keep alive a great number of survivors. You know how he came to those conclusions? I mean, he came to those conclusions because he believed what God said. He believed what, what was promised and passed down from his fathers to him. He just took God at his word. We, we would say it today. We, it's, it's, if he had a Bible, it would be because he was in his Bible. He started his day uh, with a solid foundation of, of God's word. He believed what God said. Took him at his word. God's promises were an anchor for his soul. All the way until the end. An anchor for his soul. So the question is, have you let God's word shape you? Have you let God's word shape you? Or, or are, are, would you see yourself more like the brothers? The guys who, who also had God's word, were aware of the promises, were in the inner circle, but, but didn't let God's word shape their lives. You, you know, one sense... Uh, Joseph was given a gift by, by being removed from favoritism and privilege and, and, giving no, and, and given nothing else to hope in but God's promises. I was reading uh, earlier in Genesis, and, and you just see the favoritism come up even when Jacob goes to meet his brother Esau, and he outlines this group ahead of them, and and keep this group back and this group back. And the very last one in the very back, most protected was young Joseph. I can't tell you it shoulda, woulda, coulda, what would have happened if God did something different. But, but when God took Joseph out of that position of comfort, that place where he was most comfortable and, and, and put him in really, really tough conditions, being thrown in a hole, begging for his life, half naked. His brothers had to take the cloak, sold to, to a bunch of strangers. Where did he go? What did he do? In the hardest moment, certainly, of his life, what did he hope in? He hoped in the promises of God. And so what do you hope in? Has God's word shaped you? Where's the footing for your life? Um, you know, we're desert people, but maybe if we were a seafaring people, I'd ask, where is your mooring? Where, where do you hook up to? So, so, that, so that you are, remain in one place, ballast full, steady. 
So, so that the, the waves of life that are going to come, you cannot control those. Those aren't the things you're trying to control. Like, like we heard this morning. Th- those are the things that we wish and they want, we, we would love to rearrange and dial in and calibrate and get just right. It's just that we can't do that. That's just, that's just not, God doesn't allow his people to control their lives more than he controls them. And that's good. We're the, we're the slaves of a king. So where's your mooring? Do you have one? Or are the waves of life getting the best of you? So let God's word do its work in you. Let God's word do its work in you. Let it shape you more than your circumstances. More than the circumstances that you find yourself in because you can't shape those. You have no control over those. Those will surprise you. God brings about those circumstances for your good and for his purposes. But you need to be anchored to to God's word in order to be grounded in his providence. And so what you need to know, what you need to remember tonight, it's just simple. It's a definition of, of God's providence. It's a sovereign circumstance. It's a divine purpose. And if you have your footing solid in, in the knowledge of those things, you'll, you'll have a ballast. You will have a, a ballast for life. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this evening. Lord, thank you for Joseph, his life. Thank you for what we can uh, glean from your providence, your provision, your circumstances, and even the preservation of the promises that began in the first pages of Scripture that we've seen come to pass all the way through the Bible, and surely they will come to pass in the future, Lord. We love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.